So a vector space is a set of elements that we call vectors. That's why it's called a vector space. We call them vectors. So a vector space is a set of vectors that follow these properties. You can add the two vectors. You can switch the order of the addition. Addition is commutative. And there's addition is also associative. And uh, it has an additive zero, uh, an additive zero, <laughs> uh, an additive identity. And the additive identity is called zero. Um, it has an additive inverse. The additive inverse is the negative of a vector. And then they have these things called closure properties. It's closed under addition, which means if you add two vectors, then the sum should still be within that vector space. Uh, it's distributive among vectors, scalars over the vectors, and then vectors over scalars. And then it's also associative with respect to scalars. So these are properties that we know satisfy uh, our vector spaces. And uh, the most common vector spaces that we've dealt with since we were young, <laughs> would be R2. R2, we have vectors, which we've known since pre-calculus or maybe even algebra. We've known them to be points, but you know that points are really just vectors from the origin to whatever that point is. So if we stay within the real numbers, then they would still be vectors. Um, <clears throat> if you were in Calc 3 some time ago, then you talked about the three-dimensional, the multi-dimensional vector space beyond the two dimensions. So we can go in R3. And then we can go as many components as we want. Um, then those would be all our commonly known vector spaces. Now in this class, we began introducing some weird vector spaces so from the finite space. And so those also happen to be vector spaces. Now, I'm going to put P here. Usually I put N but or something else. Uh, I'll put P here. Uh, and then N is however many dimensions we're talking about. So an example would be um, the binaries. And it depends on how long we want them to be. So let's say we have a four-component uh, four binary vector with zeros and ones. It would be denoted by something like this. Uh, some of your exams and quizzes might have had something where we were working over Z5 and then your answer has an X, Y, and a Z so it has three components. So this is the, the mod if you remember mod whatever that is and this is the, the number of components that make up the vector. <clears throat> now the thing for this to actually be a vector uh, space is the, there's a special rest restriction on the P here. Uh, anybody know why I called it P instead of M or A or another letter? What? No. Oh, pi, it should be positive, but that's not why it's called P. Prime. Prime. So for this to work out as an actual vector space, P has to be prime. If it's not prime, then weird things would happen. You might not have a multiplicative inverse or something weird like that. So it's important that that's prime. 
Uh, so these are these are the most common types of vector spaces that we uh, we can run into. But there are other types of vector spaces that might not look like vectors. Let's see if I could draw this. This is how we used to do it back in the old days. I use a, this is a P. <laughs> Let me try it again. The script P is sometimes known as a polynomial space or P and I don't know if the N is on top or in the bottom. Let's, let's put it in the bottom. So these are polynomials. of degree n. This is a vector space. What is an example of a vector in this vector space? Can you give me an example of a vector in this vector space? Anybody? What? The P sub n, which is a vector space of polynomials of degree n. Can you give me an example? How about if I say example in P2 I can have what? What? Plus x. Doesn't matter. X squared, we could have stopped at x squared. But here's an example. This is an element in P2. And we would call it a vector. This is a vector in P2, for example. Right? So the question is, is it, does it satisfy all these things? Well, when you have two of these vectors, when you have two polynomials, two, if you have two second degree polynomials, when you add them, are they still going to be second degree polynomials? Yes, so it's closed under addition. You, can you switch the order when you're adding two polynomials? Yes. Can you switch the order if we have three polynomials? Can we switch the order? or regroup? Yes. Is there a zero polynomial? Yeah, zero. So zero plus x squared plus x is going to be x squared plus x. So we know that that is uh, an element zero that exists. Is there a negative of that vector polynomial? Is there a negative of x squared minus x or x squared plus x? Yeah, just put parentheses and a negative sign, right? Negative x squared minus x would be the opposite. Um, is it closed under addition? If I multiply this by a scalar, if I multiply this by, by 2, is it still going to be a second degree polynomial? Yes. And uh, if I have two second degree polynomials and if I distribute, yeah, it's all going to be true. Okay. So all this is going to be true. So we can say that this is actually a vector space and these whatever random second order polynomial you can think of would be a vector in that vector space. Now the word vector seems weird for that, but that's what it is. Nick, or Vic, did you have something? Question? No, we don't. We don't. When we talk about vectors, we don't even look at um, we don't even look at the shape of the graph or anything like that. We don't look at the the details of the function. We just look at the function itself. And so that's why when I gave that example in the in the video extra video that I have, it it doesn't talk about trying to visualize this. It's not something that we can visualize. We just have to abstractly accept that it's a it's a vector space because of because it satisfies all these axioms. Yeah, Nick. What about something like x over x squared? 
x over x squared wouldn't necessarily be a polynomial anymore. Because it would be a rational function, but then we can create another family of different types of functions to be vector spaces. Yeah, sure. Dan? <coughs> Uh, probably. At least there's a way to transform this into a vector, into into what we can think of as a vector. Yeah. Uh, kind of. So the matrix, the way the matrix is going to play into this is is called. It's in the next section. It's called transformations. So right now, we want to look at this as vectors, vector spaces, but we're going to string a bunch of vectors together. Maybe it might look like a matrix, or maybe we could take a vector and apply some sort of matrix to it, transformation. And then maybe we will take a look at what Victor was asking about the, the shape of the graph. There are some matrix transformations that we're going to study that would rotate, that would uh, you know, reflect and, and do some weird things to these vectors. Okay. Rick. The exponent is like the dimension, not quite, uh, and it not necessarily because this, when we're talking about polynomials at degree n, I see uh, if if it's at p two, then um, did you say basis? Did you say basis? Oh, dimension. So you said dimension. So the dimension, uh, maybe I am jumping ahead now. Uh, basis is the things that would span everything in here. And however many basis vectors you have, that's the dimension of what you're talking about. So in P2, I'm jumping ahead, uh, basis <coughs> would be like the simplest types of functions we can make up, we can string together to make up, in this case, a second order, uh, second degree polynomial. So the basis vectors would be one, if I had a constant term, would be x for my linear term, would be x squared for my quadratic term. So I would have three basis vectors here. That would make this P2 a three-dimensional vec uh, vector space. Okay, so, but the dimension, uh, we'll, we'll talk about dimensions later on. So that's basically different from the last chapter that we learned. That yeah, so... The number of elements, well, no, it's, it's the same. We will make that connection. The number of basis vectors you have will be the dimension. Oh, the mod is different. That's different. So when we talk about the mod, we're talking about um, how we're adding or subtracting the, 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 not the vectors themselves, but the elements themselves. See, another part of this vector space is that the vector space has to be a vector space, and they have to identify what the scalars are. So scalars are real numbers, then that's easy to deal with. But here our scalars, they look like real numbers, but they're really not. They're integers. And then we don't have an infinite number of real numbers. We just have a finite number of integers. So the way a vector space is defined also is defined by the scalar and what the scalar, what scalars are so that we can make that connection. All right, there are many more vector spaces. The set of two by two matrices also forms a vector space. So set of two by two matrices would also form a vector space. 
a uh, set of three by three matrices, a set of three by five matrices. Um, if we take a look at each of those as a vector space, then they would also form vector spaces. Okay, now that we know what a vector space is, half an hour later, <laughs> uh, let's take a look at uh, the, the particular focus on the, the, the topic that we're going over is subspaces. So here, back to your actual section now. This is section 3.5, uh, a subspace. So they say a subspace of Rn, but we can take a look at this as a subspace of a vector space. Um, but Rn is a vector space. It's you know one of the most common vector spaces. So a subspace of Rn is any collection S of vectors in Rn such that, and it has to satisfy three things. So we want to prove that something's a subspace. We need to go through and say, okay, uh, is a zero vector? Does a zero vector exist? Okay, so if it does, good. And if uh, you have two vectors in S, there's a, U plus V. Uh, if you add those two vectors, are we still in S? If it is, then that's, that's two out of three. So the last one is that if you take a, a vector in S and then you scale it to anything you want, is it still going to be in S? And if it satisfies all three, then you got yourself a vector space. Okay, so the simplest approach would be taking a look at something that we can visualize and see if it works. So, and, and also what, what might be good here is to see if we can come up with examples of things that are not vector spaces as well, or not subspaces. So let's, let's go really simple and let's go to R2. So in R2, let's come up with uh, uh, with something. Let's come up with a line. Equation of a line, y equals 2x. Okay, and let's look at each point as a vector. And we know that when we talk about a point as a vector, it's actually a vector in standard position. All right. So let's see. Let's see if we satisfy the three criteria for a subspace. First of all, is zero in this line? And when I say zero, the point zero, so zero, 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 zero on this line. So yes, number one, zero, zero is on the line. So that's a check. Okay. So number two, uh, let's do this arbitrarily. Well, we could do it specifically. Let's 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 get let's try to be specific here. Um, and as an example, and then we'll try to prove it more arbitrarily. So let's do this uh, example. Uh, give me two points in this uh, in this uh, in this line. Two and four, and what else? Three and six. Agree that those two points are on that line. Okay. So let's add those two vectors as if they were vectors. 2, 4 plus 3, 6. And then that is, uh, what is it, 5, 10. Now is 5, 10 on that line? 
Yeah. Okay. That's not the way to prove this, because here we just took specific examples. What we need to do is we need to be arbitrary about it. So let's prove it arbitrarily now, now that we've gotten a sense of what's happening. So the actual proof for the second part would be to pick two arbitrary points. So let x1, y1, and x2, y2 be in S. Let's say points here in S. What does that mean? That means y is equal to 2x, right? So y1 must equal the 2x1 and y2 must equal the 2x2. According to property number 2, we have to add those two vectors. So x1 comma y1 plus x2 comma y2 should equal to, well, we just add component by component, x1 plus x2 comma y1 plus y2. But y1 is equal to 2x1 and y2 is equal to 2x2. Well, Both of those values, terms in the second component have a 2 in it, so let's take a 2 out. And, well, if you let x1 plus x2 equal a star, maybe I shouldn't put that there. then you have star comma two times star which is another point is in S. So if you can get this to look like an X value comma two times that X value then you've succeeded in saying okay that must be also on that point or on that line. Okay, so I won't quite put QED yet because we have one more thing to prove. The star represents just these two being added together, x1 plus x2. And what I want to do is I want to look at that as if, oh, what if this star looked too confusing? What if I put x3 here instead of star. So let's say x3 was equal to x2, x1 plus x2, then that means I have x3 comma 2 times x3. And now, just with a different point x, I have x comma 2x. And that's my relationship with that line. So the sum is also in S because it satisfies this relationship for the Y. Y is equal to 2 times S. Okay. All right, now the third thing we have to show, and I'll have to put it over here. The third thing we have to show is that if we have a point, uh, randomly chosen a point in S, if we scale or multiply that to be anything, it should still be in S. Well, let's give another example. Should we use 2, 4 again or 3, 6? Let's use 3, 6. 
So this is just a preview of the actual proof part. Say 3, 6 is an S. So if I multiply this, let's scale or multiply this by something. 5. Or we can even do negative. Let's do negative 5. So that means C times this element that's negative 15 comma negative 30. The question is that is this still in S? Does this still satisfy this equation? Okay. Still satisfies Because y is equal to 2 times x. Right? As long as you have y equal to 2 times x, that means you're still within your space. So to actually prove this, We can't use specific numbers. Let's get arbitrary again. So we got x1, y1 in S. That means y1 is equal to 2 times x1. And then let's randomly pick C. As any scalar. So that when I multiply C times X1, Y1, that's actually equal to C times X1 plus C times Y1 plus, I'm sorry, not a plus, there's a comma in between. So CX1 is CX1, but Y1 is equal to 2 times X1. C times 2 X1. Now, I know that when I'm dealing with real numbers, it's all commutative, associative, and all that, so I can just switch the order here. CX1, comma, 2 times that very same CX1. And then if I imagine another x3 equal to cx1, then I have x3 comma 2x3, which tells me that I'm still in S. Okay. So that proves that. And now I've proven all of them, all three of them. So that means this must be a subspace. So all three are satisfied. Conclusion, the therefore S equals all the points x, y such that y is equal to 2x must be a subspace of R2. Now I can put QED Okay. I need I'm done with the proof. <laughs> that which has to be shown or proven. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's a lot of theory behind vector spaces. And so everything that we do in matrices is based on vector spaces because 
matrices act on vectors, and matrices themselves can be seen as vector spaces as well. So you can like meta study this in many different levels. Okay. So an interesting thing to do is to come up with something that might not be might not be a, a vector space. So let's run into a couple of those examples. Okay. So a couple of examples of things that are not vector spaces. Let's stay in R2 so we can continue to visualize this. Oh, I say visualize. You know how that line looks like, right? I don't have to draw that line. It goes through the origin, blah, blah, blah. All right. Let's come up with another set. S, example, not subspace. So let's say S equals all the points X and Y in R2 such that uh, y is equal to 2x plus 1. Okay. Let's see. Um, Do you remember the three things that we have to look for? What's the first one? Zero. Is zero in here? We're done. <laughs> zero is not in S. So we're done. We don't even have to check the others. So S is not a subspace. Okay. There's no zero. X and Y, the pair has to be zero. If you put zero in for X, Y is equal to one. Put zero in for Y, X is equal to whatever. <laughs> Negative a half or something. So, no. Zero is not. The zero vector, that meaningful zero vector is not in a subspace. So we can be done here. Okay. Let's do another example. <coughs> Unit disk in R2. So S is equal to all the points X and Y such that X squared plus Y squared is less than or equal to 1. So within that circle, let's consider every single point inside of that circle, including the circle itself. So let's see, is this a vector space? Is zero in this vector space? Zero, the point zero, zero is in S, okay? So that checked out. So if we take two points from this and we add these two points, are we still going to be within this disk? No. Can you give me two examples? Can you give me two vectors where we, if we add it, we'll be outside of this circle? So the neat thing about proving something that's a contradiction is that all we have to do is come up with an example. So example. I guess they call this a counter example.
A counter example would be, give me a point in the disk. Zero, one. Give me another point in the disk. One, zero. So if we add them, so this is V, this is U, U plus V. One, zero, plus zero, one. I might have switched the order. Doesn't matter, it's commutative. Is one, one. And one, one doesn't satisfy this anymore. So one, one is not an S. This would be a good time to visualize this. You got a circle. So the first one where zero, zero is in that. So that's good, that worked out. The next one, we have two points. Those two points, but then when we added them together, we get one, one. And now I'm out of that circle. So I, I failed to, um, to stay within that circle. That's a, that's the, they call it closed or closure property. You could say it's not closed under addition because if I add two vectors and I'm not within that subspace still, then that means I jumped out of the subspace, so it's not a subspace. Okay. <coughs> yes. No, no, you can work with R15. So <laughs> it's uh, R2 is for starters. For us, we're going to focus on R2 and R3. But technically, the subspaces, we can, we can do R4, R5. We can even do functions. We can do polynomials, and we can ask ourselves, is this closed under, you know, is the set of polynomials closed under addition, subtraction, and, and stuff like that if we do subspaces. So we can do lots of things. Uh, so fortunately for us, we'll just do R2 and R3 because they're visual. <laughs> you can still visualize them. But these things do exist everywhere else. Okay. <clears throat> so those are examples of non-subspaces. Um, in fact, maybe we should draw... This subspace over here is 2x plus 1, so it's a line passing through that point. It has a slope of 2. <coughs> so the curious question is, in R2, we're in R2, what kind of subspaces can we possibly get? Can we count the number of subspaces we can possibly get? Or if, if not count it, can we at least describe? So if I change this in from a circle to a square, what if this was a, a, a square instead of a circle? Could it still be subspace? If we scale or multiply it, our third one, right? If we have a vector going through any point here, if we scale it far enough, it'll go outside beyond the, any boundary that we might have. So the question is, what kind of subspaces are we looking at in R2? What are the possible subspaces? Uh, let's see, what else do they say here? Span. Let's throw this uh, theorem in here in the mix and continue talking about all the possible subspaces in R2. So let's say you have a certain amount of vectors in Rn. The span of those would just be a linear combination of any of these things, right? So we scalar multiply it, we add whatever is there, and then they will form a subspace. <coughs> so let's focus on R2.
<clears throat> let's randomly come up with let's come up with one vector in R2. Give me a vector in R2. One, two. Let's do one, two. Okay, this is a vector in R2. What is the span of this? The span of this vector is going to be any linear combination. Well, we can't talk about linear combination because we only have one thing. Right? So I just say scalar multiple C times V is a span of this. Uh, let's look at this from a visual point of view. And that's the whole reason why we're doing R2 is that we can visualize this. Just on the XY plane, my vector 1, 2 goes from the origin, 1, 2. This is my vector. Now what is C times 1, 2 going to look like if I let C equal to negative 5? Going in the opposite direction. What if I let C equal to positive 3? Going in the same direction. C equal uh, negative one half. Going here, here, here. So regardless of what I choose for C, I am kind of restricted here, right? So what do I have here? What is my if I let C equal to every single real number there is? and then I mark that as a point or as a vector in R2, what am I going to get? A line. Be more specific. <laughs> it's an infinite line. There's something special about this line that has to correspond with one of the properties for a subspace. It has to go through zero. We randomly chose, Alex chose 1, 2. But we could have had 0, 1, somebody said 0, 1. And that would have been another line, right? Except going in the direction of 0, 1. Uh, you could have had anything, negative 3, comma 5. That would just be another line that has a certain. As long as a, that line passes through 0, then that's a subspace. So that is one type of subspace in R2. So we can say in R2, a subspace spanned, and we'll use this theorem's idea of creating a subspace, a subspace spanned by one vector is a line through the origin going through that vector. Okay? Yes. We could, but we can't, again, we can't visualize that. Uh, so when we say it's a space of polynomial, no, that, no, that's different. So polynomial of degree one is actually two-dimensional. 
because it has the linear coefficient and it has a constant coefficient. So you need two things to span it, which is different from this. So here we're looking at this geometrically, not by the equation. Does that make sense? Good question. Okay. All right. Sticking with R2. What if we have two vectors? And to make it, you know, more interesting, two vectors that are linearly independent. Now we could have two vectors that are linearly dependent. What so what would happen if we have two vectors that are linearly dependent in R2? It'd still be a line. They're parallel, right? They would go through the origin. They they could be parallel, they can go in the same direction or opposite direction, it doesn't matter. But they would still span a line, because if you add them together, you're essentially just scalar multiplying it. Okay? So to make it a little bit more interesting, let's pick V1 and V2, or V1 and U. Let's call this U and V, uh, linearly independent. So let's pick a couple linearly independent vectors in R2 and let's see what this thing is going to span. Uh, so give me an example of a vector in R2. One zero, and then another vector in R2 that's linearly independent from this. Three five. Uh, I, I think I'm pretty convinced that these two are linearly independent. Right? Are you? Okay. So these two vectors are linearly independent. And let's see how they would look like. So the span of U and V is going to be the linear combination of those two vectors. What this means is that I can put any number for C1 and C2. I don't know why I'm using C1 and C2. I could put any number for C1 and C2, and whatever result I get here is going to be part of my span. Okay? Now, we'll talk about trying to obtain the span in a minute, but let's, let's think about this visually. I have 1, 0. And I have 3, 5. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I have these two vectors. What is the span of these two vectors? Remember, I can scale these things, scalar multiply, I can scale these vectors, positive, negative, as small or as big as I want, and I can add them together. Circle? Would it just be stuck to a circle? So if I add these two, I can do my, my addition, so that parallelogram business. I don't know if I need to. If I'm over here. So so Nick has an answer. He said all of R2. Is that correct? Did you buy that? Because they're linearly independent, they're two-dimensional, and they're in R2, they're linearly independent. Now, if if this does in fact span all of R2. That means I can randomly pick a, a point in R2 and I can solve for C1 and C2 to get to that point. So give me a random point in R2. 2, 4. 1, 2, 4. I don't know, somewhere over here. So that means I should be able to find 2, 4 
by putting in an appropriate C1 plus C2 being multiplied by those u and v vectors. So, uh, I don't really want to solve for this, but let's do it anyway. So, two, I'm going to write it vertically now just so I can get a clearer picture here. So try not to do the systems of linear equations and stuff. So, C1 and 0 plus 3C2 and 5C2. So, we have an answer for C2, right? Looks like C2 is equal to 4 fifths. And then if we can solve for C1. So C1 is equal to 2 minus 3 times 4 fifths. I don't care what this number is. The fact that I can find that number C1 and C2. So uh, it looks like we can randomly pick any point in R2. And then if we can find a C1 and C2 to get to that point, that means this thing must span all of R2. So U and V must span all of R2. So, that must be another vector space, but it's everything. Yeah, it is. Okay. So that's another subspace of R2. So a subspace of R2 can either be all of R2 a line passing through the origin. There's one more subspace that may not be obvious. Zero. <clears throat> so let's summarize this. And we can actually say that we've gathered all the possibilities here, and these are the only possible subspaces in R2. Okay? So one type of subspace in R2 is just a zero. If you just consider the set with only one element zero, that's a subspace. Well, it turns out that if zero is in there, then it satisfies the first one definitely, right? Because zero is in the subspace. And if you add two vectors, you should still be within the subspace. Well, I only have one vector, zero, so zero, zero plus zero, zero is equal to zero, zero. So that must also be in a subspace. And if I scale or multiply this, it would still be in the subspace turns out that zero times anything is zero, so I'm still within the subspace. So this is one type of subspace in R2. The second type of subspace in R2 is a line passing through the origin. Okay. We saw that via one example, 
And we saw another example of a line where it did, if it didn't pass through the origin, then it wasn't a subspace because zero wasn't part of it. And in the last example, or second to last example, we saw that this subspace was spanned by one vector. So another type of subspace in R2 is all of R2. which incidentally was, by the way we did it in the example, was spanned by two linearly independent vectors. Okay? So that's it. There are no more possible subspaces. That circle of radius one is not a subspace. If I just take a look at all the positive numbers uh, above the xy plane, if I just take a look at that, that's not a subspace either. Right? Because if I scale or multiply by a negative number, I'm on the other side, and that can't be. All right. We will be talking about dimensions. So since we are talking about these subspaces in R2, let's identify the dimension. What's the dimension of R2? Let's start with the bottom one here. What's the dimension of R2? What? X and Y. So when we talk about dimension, I just want a number, 2. So all of R2 is a two-dimensional thing. What's the dimension of a line? Now, a line itself. How many dimensions is the line? One. And here I just have a zero vector. Let's just call it a zero dimension. Turns out that it's not a coincidence that whatever is spanned by however many linearly independent vectors is spanning this is the same as the dimension. We'll talk about that later. We're in R2, but when you're looking at the line itself, it's just a one-dimensional thing. If I asked you to draw me something in one dimension, what would you draw? I would draw a line, right? That's something in one dimension. So a line is one-dimensional. Okay, without talking much more about this, I'm going to tell you all the possible subspaces in R3. Zero vector is a subspace in R3. A line through the origin spanned by one vector is a subspace in R3. What else is a subspace in R3? All of R3. Is a subspace in R3. What else is a subspace in R3? Plane. Plane through, it has to go through the origin, right? Because zero has to be there. A plane through the origin, turns out, is something that can be spanned by two linearly independent vectors.
So the point is a zero-dimensional thing in R3. The line is a one-dimensional thing in R3. The plane is a two-dimensional object in R3. And then all of R3 is a three-dimensional space. OK? So we'll, we'll define, formally define dimension. But here, these are all the possible subspaces in R3. R4 has five, including zero itself. Yeah. 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 Nope. Nope. Oh, yeah. I mean, in, in the R4, there's a three-dimensional subspace that's the space that we're able to visualize. Well, you could take smaller subspaces like two dimensions and one dimension. A subspace, yeah, is contained within the higher dimensional space. All right. All right. So these things we can visualize, and uh, next time we'll try to go venture off into other weirder spaces. See you guys next time.